Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Andy Linehan, president of the City Club. Welcome to City Club's Friday Forum with Nobel Laureate and Harvard professor Dudley Robert Hirschbach, who will tell us a little about why the impossible takes a little longer. But before we begin our program, I have the usual City Club announcements. Next Friday, May 7th, City Club and the so Slow Food Portland team uh, give, gear up to give together a uh, forum called A Taste of Food Policy, which is an exciting kickoff to a three-part summer series that looks, at, that looks at Oregon's recipe for food policy. Ron Paul will moderate a panel composed of Katie Koba, Director of the Oregon Department of Agriculture, Deborah Lippolt, Executive Director of Growing Gardens, and Brian Roter, President of New Seasons Markets. This program will take place at PSU's new Native American Student and Community Center at the south end of downtown. Read more about this forum in your bulletin, and then you can make your reservations online at www.pdxcityclub.org. Also in the new bulletin that's just out today is the slate of nominees for officers and members of the City Club's 2004-2005 Board of Governors. The election will be held at the City Club's annual meeting on June 4th. Please take a minute to review the slate of candidates and uh, be aware of uh, who's on the uh, slate before the annual meeting on June 4th. On Wednesday, May 12th, at Kells Irish Pub, City Club's new Leaders' Council hosts an informal evening reception with former Secretary of, Secretary of State of Oregon, Clay Myers. This is a great opportunity to meet a man many have called an icon of an era and a quiet revolutionary. Check your bulletin or go to the website uh, to find out more information. In May, our book discussion group, Citizens Read, picks up Ray Oldenburg's The Great Good Place. The group normally meets on the last Monday of each month, but because of the Memorial Day holiday, Citizens Read will meet on uh, June 2nd at the Zimmerman Community Center to discuss The Great Good Place. There are only a few weeks left in City Club's uh, spring membership drive. If you've been thinking about joining, this is the perfect time to become a member. Each week, we've been holding raffles for prizes for new members. And if you join this week, we'll put your name into a drawing for Ray Oldenburg's The, 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 Grand, the Great Good Place, the Book of the Month, the club selection for our club uh, discussion group. Thanks to Looking Glass uh, Books for providing this week's prize. Membership brochures and forms are on each table or are available from staff. Join City Club today and you could be our next winner. I'd like to especially welcome students from the Quest School who are sitting at some of the front tables here today and thank their sponsor, the law firm Lindsay Hart, Neal & Weigler. Broadcast of City Club for programs this quarter is made possible by corporate underwriting from Kaiser Permanente, Pope and Talbot Inc., and Shorebank Pacific. We're very grateful for their help, their support for our programs. I also want to remind you that City Club, uh, the City Club forums are also available in either audio CD or videotape for purchase from the club offices. So on to our program. In May, Portland will host the world's largest pre-college celebration of science. The Intel Science and Engineering Fair will bring together 1,300 students from 40 nations to compete for scholarships, tuition grants, internships, scientific field trips, and the grand prize, which is a trip to attend the Nobel Prize ceremonies in Stockholm. PhD scientists and engineers from universities and from firms throughout the region, such as my own firm, CH2M Hill, will act as judges for the students' projects. The fair has not been held in the Pacific Northwest, Northwest since 1962, and then it was held in Seattle. Last year, however, the Portland organization Youth Exploring Science made a successful bid, bid to bring the fair to Portland. One of the exciting aspects of the fair is the opportunity for students to work closely with the highest caliber of scientists, including 12 Nobel laureates. We have a taste of the Nobel talent here today with us in our speaker, Professor Dudley Robert Hirschbach. He's the Frank, B, B, Frank Baird, Jr. Research Professor of Science at Harvard University. As an undergrad, Professor Hirschbach played football for Stanford University and was invited to try out for the then Los Angeles Rams. Last November, he lent his voice to the Tree Houses of Horror episode of TV, TV's The Simpsons. And in between, Professor Hirschbach managed to take home a little award called the Nobel Prize. Professor Hirschbach holds degrees in mathematics and chemistry from Stanford and physics and chemical physics from Harvard. After teaching for many years at Harvard and the University of California, Berkeley, he is now engaged in several efforts to improve K through 16 science education and the public understanding of science. He chairs the Board of Trustees of Science Service, which publishes, publishes Science News and conducts the Intel Science Talent Search and the Intel International Science and Engineering Fair. 
Among his other awards are the Linus Pauling Medal in 1978, the Michael Polanyi Medal in 1981, the National Medal of Science in 1991, the Yaroslav Hirovsky Medal in 1992, and the William Walker Prize in 1994. In 1998, Chemical and Engineering News named Professor Hirschbach among, Hirschach among the 75 leading contributors to chemistry in the past 75 years. Welcome, Professor Hirschbach. Thank you, Andy. I'm, of course, delighted to be here. Um, when I saw that this was to be in an athletic center in the ballroom, I had a little different image of what I might look at uh, in the moment. But uh, I did enjoy sports a lot. And science is another such thing that's very much a sporting proposition. My father had a favorite saying, the difficult we do immediately, the impossible takes a little longer. That appealed to me, especially the second phrase, very much as a kid. I guess the whimsical incongruity and heroic ring of the impossible takes a little longer. Of course, that referred to things that people thought were impossible. But during my scientific career and my teaching career, I've had many times to reflect on that motto. It's so inspiring to see what seemed impossible, and I've seen it over and over in the 50 years I've been involved in science, become something very possible and, in fact, transforming. And likewise with students. I've seen many students who didn't look likely to be terribly uh, successful in any line of enterprise, who did turn out impossibly wonderful. And so it's been a joy in both those respects. Of course, uh, you've looked in the papers, as I have recently, uh, to note that this is almost the 50th anniversary of something long regarded as impossible, namely Roger Bannister breaking the four-minute mile limit which happened a year ago at Oxford University on a track there, 50 years ago, uh, um, one week from now. And uh, I thought I had to mention that since we're speaking in an athletic center. And also, in that case, you'd say the impossible took a little shorter. Uh, but I want to begin uh, my remarks about uh, science and science education with a uh, story that deals with an impossible, in quotes, educational triumph. Because I think it conveys, in addition to some sort of explicit aspects regarding what you could call educational strategy, uh, some implicit uh, notions of key aspects of the scientific enterprise, including especially the practical value, the practical value of so-called curiosity-driven research, and the kinship of science and the humanities, two things I feel are very important from the educational point of view. Uh, now, the brilliant educational experiment is a story involving Alexander Graham Bell, Helen Keller, and her teacher, Annie Sullivan. Everyone, of course, knows about uh, Alexander Graham Bell inventing the telephone but few people are aware of how he came to invent the telephone. He actually regarded his life's work as teaching the deaf. His mother was deaf. His wife, who had first been one of his students, was deaf. His father and grandfather were his mentors, for they were teachers of speech. In uh, 1870, his family immigrated in Scotland because his two older brothers had both died of TB, and he at that time was a sickly kid in danger of the same fate. They settled near Toronto, and he went down to Boston and began teaching uh, deaf students, and the next year founded his own school for the deaf. Now, all of his students were not totally deaf, and it was in an effort 
to develop a device to help his partially deaf students to distinguish between P and B that led him to invent the telephone. I mention that because, like many stories, this one has details in it that um, illustrate major points that many of these impossible things that develop into transforming ideas or discoveries in science and other enterprises really start from some small thing that uh, is initiated by a concern about a practical matter or an aim, uh, or just pure and simple curiosity. So he didn't know anything about electricity and magnetism. And yet in 1876, he was the one who turned in the patent a few hours ahead of uh, several other inventors uh, for the telephone. And you know a lot about the story since then. He did have to spend 18 years defending his patent and lawsuits, so it's the most thoroughly documented invention in history as a result. But uh, he liked to say in his later years that he would not have been the one to succeed, even though, as his biographers emphasized, by 1872, several years earlier, everything that was needed to be known about the technical details that went into the telephone was already known. And there were people more expert than he in the technology that it needed. But why did he invent it? He said he thought it was because he wouldn't have been the inventor if he had known more about the technical aspects, but less about human speech, which he knew as a teacher or as a deaf, and, and about uh, music. It was, in fact, while playing the piano at his fiancée's home, they had the key insight that underlies the operation of a telephone. That's uh, the essence of what, what you know about the background of Alexander Graham Bell. Now, Helen Keller, as you probably know, is deaf and blind since the age of 19 months after she had a severe illness. She was six when she was brought to Bell by her parents to ask his opinion whether he thought she could be educated. And he made the arrangements that led to uh, having Annie Sullivan become her teacher. Annie Sullivan was then 20 years old, had no experience whatsoever in teaching. But she and her younger brother had uh, been confined, that's the right word, are condemned, you could say, to the poorhouse because they were orphans. They had very rudimentary access to education there, but she had what turned out to be the good luck of becoming blind from trachoma, Annie Solomon did, temporarily for four or five months. And so she was sent to the Perkins School for the Blind, where she got an excellent education for a few years. And I hope some of you may want to read the valedictorian address that she gave when she graduated from Perkin at the level of high school and realize this was a young woman who had only about three years of education at all. Um, so that was her background. And yet, as you know, uh, guided only by her good sense and acute sensitivity, when she went in 1887 to the home of Helen Keller in Tuscumbia, Alabama, uh, she worked what was called a miracle. Within a month, she was able to convey to Helen the idea of a word. Probably you've seen the scene uh, holding Helen's hand under a flow of water while Annie spelled in the word water and Helen got the inspiration, and learned that things had names. Within three months, Helen was writing simple letters. Within three years, she had a complete command of idiomatic English. Now, this is really quite amazing. Uh, anyone who's had to learn a foreign language uh, knows how hard it is, and English is one of the hardest because it's a polyglot mixture of several <laughs> languages. And the idiomatic aspects are really tricky. So to think that a blind and deaf person could develop such a mastery. 
And then, of course, that, like other things in her career that follow, were, were, was hailed properly as a miracle. But Bell had a different view. That's the key aspect of this story I'm telling you now. He said it was not a miracle. It was a result of a brilliant educational experiment by Annie. And he should know, because he was a mentor for many years afterwards. He not only supported them financially, but was in continual contact with them. Helen dedicated her first autobiography, which she wrote as a student at Radcliffe. It's another miracle that she could even go to Radcliffe in those days. Uh, she dedicated her autobiography to Bell. And Annie, uh, in her autobiography, uh, wrote, uh, about Bell and what an immense advantage it was to have his advice and support. And particularly, she expressed her gratitude for his happy way of making people feel pleased with themselves. That's the kind of mentor he was, and not only to Helen and Annie. Um, now, uh, what Bell said and insisted, in fact, you can read again what he wrote about it, was that Helen's mastery of idiomatic English was, quote, not a case of supernatural acquirement, but a question of instruction, a brilliant experiment by Annie. He concluded that the key was Annie's, quote, constant spelling of natural idiomatic English into Helen's hand without stopping to explain unfamiliar words and constructions, and her encouragement of Helen's reading book after book in Braille with a similar reliance and context to explain new language. Bell stressed that this was equivalent to the way a hearing and sighted child learns. And Annie's own description, which you can read, of her teaching confirms that she purposely never explained anything unless Helen asked. Thereby, Annie helped Ellen to discover and actively exercise her ability to discern clues and context and learn on her own. Well, when I came across this aspect of the saga in a wonderful biography of Bell by Robert Bruce, published in 1990, of course, I went like this. All these years, I've been doing my best to explain things to students <laughs> without their asking. <laughs> so it had a big effect on how I tried in my own teaching to proceed after that. But it, it, it's more than that. Uh, I want to let you ask questions, so I won't try to underline so much, but I want to mention some key aspects, as I said in the first remarks, that I think are embodied in this saga. First is about science as deciphering nature's language. The reticent teaching style of Annie Sullivan is intrinsic to scientific research. Nature is a reticent teacher. She speaks to us abundantly, but in many alien tongues. They're not foreign, they're alien in the strongest sense of the word. She does not offer explanations. It's us to ask probing questions and to generate our own understanding. And in front, frontier research, what scientists are trying to do is to discover or add to knowledge of the vocabulary and grammar of some strange dialect. To the extent the scientists succeed, we gain the ability to decipher many messages that nature has left for us. Sometimes, long time ago, she left them for us. But we couldn't read them. Often when we can read them, we have the sense she left them very blithely, blithely or coyly. Uh, and often we see, in retrospect, that uh, no matter how much human effort and money we invest to solve some practical problem, we can't do it unless we can read the answers that nature is willing to give us. So this makes clear the practical value of investment in so-called curiosity-driven research, which is really this business of deciphering some of nature's language. We're all born blind and deaf to much of nature's language, and it takes persistent groping and guessing to learn something of it. 
I like to emphasize this to my students. So I ask, as I'll ask you, how many have studied a foreign language? Yeah, most of you. So you have some sense what's involved in doing it. Well, studying science, especially introductory science, is exactly that. There's been studies made that count the actual words in first year textbooks in chemistry, biology, physics, and find that the new words or the old words used in new ways add up to more than the vocabulary in a typical one-year language course. And then there's the concepts. They play the role of grammar. Every teacher of science is aware, reading examinations, that uh, students may have more of the vocabulary, but none of the grammar they need to make sense in answering questions on exams and so forth. So. Uh, recognizing this, I think, is valuable for the students as well as teachers. You need to recognize what's involved in studying a foreign language, and in particular, to recognize how it goes. The old saying, once you get it in your ear, then of course it gets easier and easier. But if you don't make the effort and are motivated to go far enough to start getting in your ear, then it gets harder and harder. That's exactly the experience of most people with science and mathematics. I've talked with a great many students who were turned off from science or math in their academic trajectory because they didn't begin to get it in their ear and they weren't confident that they could see how they were supposed to go about dealing with this really alien kind of language. Uh, so that's a key thing. Actually, I can't help but mention in my freshman chemistry course that I taught for a long time, I would point out to students that we were going to be true to the tradition of a Harvard education. Harvard started in 1636, and for almost 200 years afterwards, the major part of the curriculum was Latin, Greek, and Hebrew. Well, in this chemistry course, when we talk about thermodynamics, that's really Latin because it has this universal kind of austere character. Uh, when we talk about quantum theory that underlies the ideas of molecular structure, and elect what electrons do and all, we're learning Greek. In fact, you have to use a good part of the Greek alphabet in this discussion of quantum ideas. And then finally, when we talk about what's called chemical kinetics, what's, what governs is reaction rates and how fast molecules can be transformed into other ones, we're doing something very much like learning Hebrew, which is, uh, as I understand, a very sort of practical and forthright language. So I want them to appreciate this cultural aspect because I think it actually is a help, not just for fun, but a serious thing. Now, it also emphasizes the, the sort of kinship, as I view it, of science and the liberal arts. The impossible empowerment of Helen Keller by language exemplifies, I think, in a compelling way, the highest aim of a liberal arts education, which I take to be to instill the habit, the habit of self-generated questioning and thinking, of actively scrutinizing evidence and puzzling out answers. Isn't that what we want? Uh, educated citizens to be able to do in whatever field they pursue, above all. And science should be a strong way of, of enhancing that in the ed experience of students. It's certainly the essence of a genuine scientific literacy. It also fits with a favorite definition that I think applies equally well to science and the humanities, namely, education's what's left after all you've learned has been forgotten. If there's nothing left, you were trained, you weren't educated. And uh, this defines the aim to be understanding rather than ritualistic training, cultural perspective and self-reliant thinking rather than conventional knowing. That's the point. Now the what's left aspects of science and mathematics really offer much that transcends any technical uh, particulars. Uh, and both novice scientists and students destined for other careers, I think, can appreciate if, if teachers emphasize the human adventure of intellectual exploration. Uh, 
which is replete with failures and foibles, and, but ultimately achieves remarkable progress. And uh, I want to say a word how that's the case. But I wanted to quote at this point uh, an appeal to cultivate uh, common ground between uh, science and the liberal arts that I heard when I was a beginning graduate student from Isidore Rabi, himself a very outstanding physicist. And he wrote, to my mind, the value of science or the humanities lies not in the subject matter alone or even in greater part. It lies chiefly in the spirit and living tradition with which these different disciplines are pursued. Our problem is to blend these two traditions. The greatest difficulty which stands in the way is communication. The non-scientist cannot listen to the scientists with pleasure and understanding. I'm sorry, but it's all too often true. <laughs> Only by the fusion of science and humanities can we hope to reach the wisdom appropriate to our day and generation. The scientists must learn to teach science in the spirit of wisdom and in the light of the history of human thought and human effort rather than as the geography of a universe uninhabited by mankind. That's his phrase that I like so much. <laughs> Too often, that's, I'm afraid, how science comes across and the way we teach it. So to allude back to uh, the language metaphor, uh, in our nation we know that even though students take some foreign languages in class, how many of them really reach the point where they can make use of them? It's because we don't have the need or motivation so strongly that that's the case here. Whereas a totally different, say, in Europe, where kids study um, English in particular, uh, no matter what their native language is from an early age, and they speak it better than most Americans by the time they graduate from high school. It's really impressive. Uh, is there not a lesson there? They have to be motivated and have a need to do it. And I think that tells us something important about our, our educational enterprise. As long as we keep teaching science and math in separate courses, it's not going to be integrated into our general culture in the way that really should be part of the birthright of our stu students in the 21st century. So I think we have to think how to put science and math appropriately into so-called non-science courses in a natural way. And again, the question period, we might explore that further. Now, I've tried to emphasize these aspects in, uh, in my uh, teaching. For example, when I discuss uh, a meat and potatoes part of any curriculum in chemistry, the gas laws, I like to describe it in terms of a parable that goes back to Aristotle and all. I can again enlarge on that in the question, but, but at the end of this parable, I um, pose the question to the students, uh, what if Hercules had been asked a 13th labor? You all know about his 12. Uh, I hope you all have a favorite among his 12 labors. Mine is, uh, shoveling out the Aegean stables, because that's what I did as a farm boy a lot, and maybe I'm still doing that. You can judge for yourself. <laughs> but, but I said, what if there were a 13th labor of Hercules to weigh the Earth's atmosphere? Would he have succeeded? Huh? It would have been very interesting if he did, because then we'd have nicely integrate in something that has, involves a little bit of science into a major myth. But he might have failed. It seems fairly likely. And that I would ask the students to think about, would that be maybe a very good thing that in one of uh, the stories, and after all, the shared stories define cultures and civilizations and societies, one of the such stories would be about a hero of great courage and strength who failed for lack of an intellectual concept. That's the key thing that you need. The students, when they discuss the gas laws, find that it only takes a couple simple ideas to allow you to calculate the mass of the Earth's atmosphere. Those of you who haven't figured it out yet, I know we have some students here. <laughs> it's six billion megatons. It's a much bigger number than you might have guessed offhand, right? And there are a lot of consequences. Just from knowing that number and a couple others, you can uh, draw some other interesting conclusions. 
But I want to conclude soon with these remarks, and um, my next major heading is to reflect a little bit on what makes impossible, in quotes, possible. That's the aspect we celebrate so much in science. And um, this involves emphasizing something that I think uh, is hardly ever mentioned in my hearing, at least. But science enjoys a tremendous advantage over other human activities. Namely, what you're after, call it truth or understanding, waits patiently for you. <laughs> so that means ordinary human abilities, uh, over time, if applied with perseverance and with sufficient freedom and support, are bound to learn something valuable. Contrast that with human activities such as business, politics, sports, or sadly war. You may make a brilliant move, but if it's a little early or a little late, it can turn into a fiasco instead of a triumph. In science, you get to foul up over and over, and still you get there. I like to say to my students, to be a scientist is a bit like being a musician. You need to love what you're doing, to work at it and develop your potential, master your instrument and all. But you know what? You can play 99.99% of the notes wrong, get one right occasionally, be wildly applauded, appropriately applauded. <laughs> and now, that is not the picture of science that most kids get in school and so forth. So I think we scientists have uh, the opportunity, the obligation to try to reduce this. So uh, another aspect, the patience of scientific truth comes into play, is that very often what is thought to be the most promising approach by consensus doesn't pan out. They're unanticipated roadblocks. So then you can see how important it is to have the flexibility to allow some maverick to try some unorthodox approach. Again and again in the history of science, that's the answer. The maverick may not solve the problem, but they get people to look at it in a different way and see how to deal with it, how to get around the roadblock. Now think how different that is than science is encountered in typical high school or college courses. There, the emphasis seems right away to get the right answer for some problems that are posed by some approved procedure. That's completely different than real science. You don't know the right answer. Nobody does. Nobody even knows necessarily the right approach always. So there's a huge premium on bringing a different view, often a maverick or unorthodox view. So that's why in my classes, I always assign students to write poems because I say I'm worried about these textbook exercises. They tell you what you need to know, nothing more, nothing less, and then you see, well, I can uh, juggle this thing and find a formula. So I try to give them lots of problems where there's no formula. They have to invent things. And a poem is such a problem. There's nothing right or wrong. It's a question, do you bring maybe to a familiar situation uh, your own personal perspective that puts it in a, a, a new light. I also show them a lot of poems that pertain to science, even though they didn't necessarily intend to. A favorite one is a quadrain by Jacques Sackel, a Czech poet. He said, poets don't invent poems. The poem is somewhere behind. It's been there a long, long time. The poet merely discovers it. Now, the social organization of science is something else that needs to be better appreciated. And here, uh, it has a major role in fostering impossible achievement. Uh, a especially strong case for this was given by Michael Polanyi uh, in a classic essay called The Republic of Science. You wonder you think of Plato's Republic, of course. And uh, he contrasted the hierarchical systems that are adopted in practical affairs with the chaotic freedom of science. He imagined an incredibly complicated, huge jigsaw puzzle, and imagined a military team, a business team, and so on, approaching this with the same talent, but different organization. In the hierarchical organizations, which we use for all practical affairs, you always have an array of officers, and uh, reports are sent up and down this chain, uh, result in analysis at different points, and orders 
to perform and whatnot. And he contrasts this with science where all the independent results uh, units can run, co -at, co -at, in a chaotic way, run around and just find pieces of the puzzle that intrigue them, but with a key proviso that they have to immediately tell everybody else what they found. Look here, I found these yellow pieces go together, so on. So to observe and report is the key. Because as he emphasizes, this creates community of explorers who, who, whose results all amplify the individual initiatives. They're coordinated, as he said, with an invisible hand in the Adam Smith sense. A very nice aspect. Now again, there's an ironic contrast between this intrinsic cooperation that's involved in scientific activity with the image people have, especially uh, enhanced because we test people and make them think that they're competing with each other and so on. So in my courses, I just don't allow students to compete. I make it impossible for them to compete, except with this absolute scale that I define. We can talk more about that if you want to. <laughs> but this, this has many benefits. It's har hard for the students to adjust because they've been conditioned to think that they're competing with other students all the time. But uh, you can have students then team up and work together on problems. Much more fun and much more real life as well. Um, you can do many nice things. So um, this mode of encouraging students to formulate and uh, work together and particularly to defend guesses. I always try to make them guess in little teams of the answers to pro problems I pose and then see how it comes up. Defend guesses is much uh, uh, more feasible when you're getting away from this notion that doing, getting the right answer quickly for sort of standard exercise is what it's all about. We've got to break that down. And I like to tell my students that um, not so many years from now, most of you will be considered expert in something. And then you're going to discover that clients come to you often uh, to ask your opinion. But not because you, they think you know more than anyone else, but because they think you can guess better since you're an expert. That's the key thing. And our educational enterprise doesn't foster that. All right, now uh, I should soon uh, go to the question session, but uh, I wanted to say a few words about empowering students as teachers and learners. Uh, here you've heard Andy speak of, yes, youth exploring science, a marvelous title, uh, because it's so positive, yes, yes, yes. Uh, and already it has transformed things in Oregon. At the beginning, two or three years ago, there was only one science fair in Oregon. Now there are 10. And of course, you have the biggest science fair of all, ICEF, coming up uh, very soon. I've been involved for quite a few years now with Science Service, the little nonprofit organization in Washington that really runs these, but of course with a vital sponsorship now of Intel in particular and many other uh, supporters uh, over many decades. And not me personally, Science Service decades. I've been maybe 15 years involved. And it's so inspiring to see uh, this scene. For example, the students who will come here 1,300 or so to ISEF in Portland will all have been winners in regional, state, or local fairs that all told involve about a million students. And just think, all those students have parents and friends and relatives who are aware to some extent of what they're doing. So this helps convey probably more than uh, many of our educational enterprises a real sense of what science is like. The thing that's so important in my mind about these fairs is that the student takes ownership of their project. That's the key thing all along the line in any kind of true education. If there's something what's left after all you've forgotten, as all you've learned has been forgotten. And students can be genuine partners in the educational enterprise uh, I'd like to say more about that in the question session. 
But I want to fin finish with just a few words by sort of a benediction. You made reference to the Nobel Prize, and that's often awarded for uh, so-called impossible ideas or discoveries that became possible and transforming. Uh, but it also has a special, in my mind, kind of link to the story I told you at the outset. Uh, you've all seen images, I'm sure, of the Nobel Medal, right? And what, what comes to mind when you see them? Uh, the image of Alfred Nobel. Well, that's certainly appropriate. But it's much more interesting to turn the Nobel Medal over and look at the backside. Uh, and on the backside, you find first a Latin inscription around the periphery of the medal. It's from Virgil. And it, in rough English translation, would say, uh, it's a pleasure to have brought cultivation to life through the discovered arts. What I like so much about that particular inscription is it's the same inscription on the medal for the Nobel Prize in literature, in physics, in medicine, in chemistry. So back in 1901, when the medal was launched, the first medals for prizes were awarded, at least then that was the view of this kinship. And I think it is a true message of the Nobel Prizes. These kind of activities in literature, in peace especially, in science and all, they are a valuable thing for the future of humanity. But if you look a little further, you see two feminine figures on the back of the Nobel Prize. Uh, one is standing erect, the other kneeling. The figure standing erect is lab labeled in Latin natura, and she has in her right hand a cornucopia. Uh, the figure kneeling is labeled sienta. She has in her left hand a scroll, presumably recording what we've learned up till now. But with her uh, right hand, she's reaching up and lifting the veil from the face of natura and gazing intently. Well, in the story of Bell, Keller, and Sullivan, there's a photograph I'm very fond of that shows Helen, then 14, Annie, 28, with Bell, then 47, in the garden in uh, his Washington home. Uh, Helen and Alexander Graham Bell are sitting side by side Annie is standing between them. Helen has her right hand in that of Bell. It's clearly communicating him with him by touch. And with her left hand, Helen is reaching up to read the lips of Annie Sullivan. Uh, to me, the classic figures on the reverse side of the Nobel Prize readily morph into this other immortal pair, Helen and Annie, student and teacher. They're so linked together with the impossible things that take a little longer. Thank you. I think we should have generated quite a few questions today. Uh, as you know, City Club members have the right to ask questions of our speakers. Uh, our first question today will co come from our board host, Nikki Lynch. She's a, she's a senior financial consultant at Merrill Lynch, and she also chairs our program committee. While she's asking her question, others, please line up behind the microphone. Uh, when your moment comes, please identify yourselves as City Club members. We'll also extend that, uh, that privilege to our Quest students today, so if you'd like to ask questions, please do. But please uh, limit your questions to 30 seconds and make sure they're a question. I do keep our question mark sign here in case uh, things turn into a statement. So, thanks, Nikki. Well, I really enjoyed that. It's very inspiring. And I, but the one moment that struck me as a, as a parent and as a person thinking about teaching was when you went like that and <laughs> said, 
you know, how you, s you know, discovered that explaining was not necessarily the way that people learned the most. And my question is, I mean, after having that realization, how did you change as a teacher? What, what things did you do? And how, how do you inspire that curiosity, which is so vital in terms of people learning? Well, basically, I asked many, many more questions of the class and waited, waited to let them answer them instead of allowing them to be just rhetorical kind of thing. Um, you just have to be patient and then try to develop from their answers. Uh, Patty Tillett, City Club member. As a follow-up to Nikki's question, um, if you were in my position right now, what question would you ask Dudley Hirschbach? <laughs> I, I would ask him, i say, how could you have given this talk and forgot to say the five or six things that you most wanted to say? <laughs> I think I would have asked that question. And I can list them later, maybe, but go ahead. Uh, Shavani Rad, City Club member. I'm a former manager at that little engineering school down the street from you on Mass Ave. Ah, uh, yes, yes. And uh, as a parent these days, I look at the schools and the what is is going as education in general, private and public schools in the United States, and I wonder what the future of the spirit of inquiry is going to be in the future, what do you think is going to sustain education versus training for our young people over the next decade? Well, I have great hope for uh, the kind of thing I spoke about with respect to science fairs and organizations like YES and so on, where the kids get to take ownership. I spoke about, uh, hinted at least, empowering kids as teachers as well as learning. I find in talking with the kids at Science Talent Search and ISEF, many of them are very concerned about exactly the kind of things we all have been talking about. And they want to be involved. I imagine that if we did it in the right way, we could help our students mentor other students, as well as providing more mentorship of our own kind. I mean, a mentor doesn't have to be someone who is there all the time, uh, but the encouragement they can give uh, is enormous. So there are kids at Harvard who deliberately set out to um, write a little magazine that they could send to their former high schools. And they were, for a while, we got some funding sent it to 1,000 high schools, which were really advising other kids uh, how you could go about applying for these science fair competitions and all the rest. And yes, of course, is doing just the same thing here. Uh, I, I, one of the things I'm, I didn't mention that I meant to, that I just learned from Nikki uh, before, is that there are programs in reading and writing. In fact, Larry Colton, who spoke here not too long ago, uh, has such a mentoring program, as I understand. So there are many things we do like that will transform uh, the teaching. We, we don't have to rely on the old notion that teaching is something we leave up to the professional teachers. We all are teachers uh, in, in every walk of life. Certainly as parents, there's nothing more important than that. Uh. Dr. Hirschbach, thank you very much. My name is Joyce Cresswell. I'm a City Club member. Um, I always say that kids are two things. They're natural lawyers because they will argue about anything. Right. And they're natural scientists because they're really curious about everything. Right, right. And somewhere along the line, we, we tend to lose that curiosity, as you've just been saying. With the, all the emphasis on outcomes and benchmarks, yep. what do you think the future for true inquiry education, either in the arts or the sciences, is really going to be mm -hmm. for us in the next decade to two decades? Well, if enough of us get concerned about it and keep talking, then presumably <laughs> what's supposed to happen is that the word will spread. My private impression is if you hear the message in enough different ways, then people begin <laughs> to think, yeah, public opinion or whatever moves things. I mean, there are huge transformations in attitudes. In our lifetime, one of them is the attitude towards smoking. You don't see any here, right? 
mean, just think how hugely different it is than, than 20 years ago. So we shouldn't be too discouraged with the prospect that it seems very hard to reform education. But if we think of reforming education as just something done in the school building itself, I, I don't think it will work. But that's why I'm so enamored of the science fairs and other things that, that get kids to take ownership. And especially if we allow them to be involved as men, junior mentors, uh, along with more senior mentors from the community, then they'll see that, for example, we sp if we talk about science or the arts, whatever, that this is something valuable and important. Otherwise, it's like a uh, foreign language in this country. The kids don't see any motivation for especially you know, any need. It's just kind of a ritualistic thing. You, for vague reasons, you have to take some in school. But it isn't the case uh, if we can broaden it in the way I've tried to describe. Good afternoon, Megan Steele, City Club member. My question relates to high school science education, and I'm interested in your view as to how important it is to have well-equipped laboratory facilities available to high school students, and I, I'd appreciate it if you could put your response in the context of the financial pressures on public schools and the high school reform movement, which is um, moving towards breaking down large schools into smaller learning communities. You know what flashes into my mind as you ask that question? My own high school, as a junior, I took chemistry. I don't think I'd ever heard of it before. I wasn't one of these kids with a chemistry set or anything. But uh, it was a wonderful course, as I learned when in college. I didn't know our little high school was so strong in teaching chemistry. <laughs> and the way it was done, the instructor never spoke to us more than 15 minutes. And then we went right in the lab every single day. Um, and we, we did things ourselves, and then we'd come back and discuss them. So I think it's very important to have a lab. Now, we didn't have any glorious facilities, but there are lots of things you can do without you know, the most up-to-date equipment, but obviously uh, you like the kids to have a chance to have access to appealing, nice, interesting stuff. And, uh, I think a lot can be done to enhance that. Let's take computers, for example. We are flooded with computers that are out of date because they're three years old or something, right? I mean, you certainly can have computers all over the place, and they ought to be nowadays part of any lab. And, uh, uh, you know, even our grandkids, two years old, are using computers. And, and certainly, we ought to have them integrated into what they would do in their labs as well. Uh, Bill Parrish, City Club member. One of my favorite natural phenomena is, is the green flash, that moment when the sun sets into the ocean. Yes. H have you seen it? And if you have, how would you describe that and maybe some other natural phenomena that you particularly enjoy? Oh, my gosh. Now, I've never seen the green flash. Uh, what flashes into my mind, however, is a poem called uh, The Purple Cow. I've never seen a purple cow. I never hope to see one. But I can tell you anyhow. I'd rather see than be one. <laughs> you know, I don't know why it, it sticks in my mind, but you have to excuse me. The author was Gillette Burgess. He later wrote, yes, I wrote The Purple Cow. I'm sorry now I wrote it, but I can tell you anyhow, I'll kill you if you quote it. <laughs> and probably I would have to say that if I attempted an explanation of the green flash right now. Because I, I remember reading an article about it, found it intriguing, but it's a little too intricate. Other phenomena, gee, there are countless phenomena that have intrigued me. Certainly, uh, the rainbow and multiple rainbows are high on the list, even though you know some people might, by now, think they've lost their mystery. But the fact is, when you uh, study the science of the rainbow, it's fascinating, both from the point of view of what actually happens in physical terms, but historically and culturally. I mean, the rainbow has been intriguing for, of course, millennia. And to trace how the ideas of what was really happening went through and how uh, when began sort of the science of the rainbow being explored, how um, it was first explained by what we would call geometrical optics, which is a 
equivalent to classical mechanics of particles, the Newtonian mechanics. And then what comes later, which is called physical optics, is equivalent to this quantum uh, structure that I referred to earlier that's really the basis for understanding uh, all of matter now in the modern era. So you can trace to all of that. You can see literally in a raindrop. It's, you know, it's really romantic and poetic in my mind. So I put the rainbow on the list. Not as exotic as the green flash. Yeah. But it's, it's quite <laughs> extraordinary. <laughs> Jonathan Hart, City Club member and avid science news reader. Um, ah, yes. I'm so glad you mentioned science news. <laughs> Stops the household with me. once a week. Um, I remember in the early 50s, I got on, uh, had the opportunity to um, fly on something that was very new, the turboprop. And now it seems we can't even get the networks to cover uh, a launch, you know, STS-104 or whatever, unless there's a disaster. Have we become jaded with this enormous amount and pace of discovery? Uh, mm -hmm. And if so, how do we get that back, how do we get that yeah. excitement back in the public for science? Yeah, I, I think there, there's terrible paradox here we have in this great age of science, the 21st century, all these things going on at such a clip. We have a gulf where People feel alienated because they can't understand how even their car works or all these things that they depend on every day. You know, so they think, well, only the special subspecies can <coughs> deal with this, you know, which is very sad and very wrong. And what I'd love to see, frankly, if I can slip in one of the things I was hoping a chance to slip in, I uh, didn't say earlier in answering that early question, I'd love to see something where our kids are used as ambassadors for science. If you go to the science fair, you'll hear them explaining their projects. They've done four or five fairs by the time they reach, say, IFF, ICEF, and they're really good at adjusting their explanation to the customer. They can tell <laughs> right away. And it's wonderful to listen to these kids. And I think we should convince some TV outfit to every day have a minute or two of a kid we don't need to hear today's weather every day, for guys' sakes. We'd like to hear tomorrow's, but they can put instead put in a minute or two about a kid's project. All you have to do is go to ISEF or Science Talent Search with a TV camera to get, get enough in the can, so to speak, in one day of filming for a year of putting these little short pieces in. And I bet you, you'd find there'd be a huge viewership because people can identify it. This might be my kid, or the kid next door, or my grandkid. And, and instead, if you put on just senior people like me, okay, it's interesting that I was on The Simpsons and once played football, but you know, it's now I'm ruined because the image is of, oh, this senior <laughs> serious scientist. Yeah, it's the, but the kids have this, what, as you, in your question, referred to, this curiosity, this natural thing bubbles out beautifully, and it's not so embarrassing. It's, Someone like me has to restrain himself a little in public, you know, but the kids don't. I think we, if we could do that one thing, we'd have a huge impact for very little cost. So. And also, if everybody donated a subscription of Science News to their local library in high school, that would help too. David Wu, City Club member, and I think of myself as a scientist wannabe, but I keep on getting yeah. distracted by other things. Yeah. Um, and That's fine. It's like being a wannabe football player. Um, Walter Mitty, you can do it. <laughs> Just subscribe to Science News and you can do it. <laughs> And, and Tuesdays, well, that's even better. A <laughs> congressman, who great. The, the the question I have for you is the intersection of the scientist and and public life. Um, and you you touched upon it briefly earlier. It certainly, and, and the role of scientists in fostering democratic development, both here mm -hmm. and especially in authoritarian countries. Well, not all certainly not all scientists are dissidents, and certainly not all dissidents are scientists. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that there's a disproportionate number of dissidents who are scientists and who mm -hmm. are struggling in authoritarian or totalitarian yes. countries. And I'd just like to hear your musings yeah. on what it is in the training, what it is in the role in society or otherwise that right. creates this uh, conjunction of scientists pushing the frontiers of their society at, at, as well as 
uh, yes, of science. I, I'm really delighted you brought up that aspect. Um, there's a wonderful book by Jacob Bernowski. You may have, many of you have seen his TV series, Ascent of Man. He's a wonderfully eloquent guy. He was really a mathematician by training, but later did a lot of biology. Jacob Bernowski called Science and Human Values. And in that, he emphasizes that science, unlike what many people say, actually uh, has it's not independent of ethics and, and values of the sort we uh, are concerned about in discussing political science, say. Um, in particular, for science to thrive, you have to have freedom of inquiry, you have to have integrity, you have to have trust. I mean, other scientists have to believe that you're not conning them and so on. And he emphasizes that those are the same criteria you need to have a democratic society. So I think this, uh, he, you would find there a beautiful, uh, much more developed answer than I can offer right now to your excellent question. But I think this is the reason that you find so many scientists. Take Sakharov in, this, in the former Soviet Union. I mean, he was an outstanding physicist, so-called the father of their hydrogen bomb. And yet he labored enormously and was reviled and suffered a lot at the hands of the government until the very end, after the fall of the Iron Curtain and all the rest, when they then had a legislature. Within a few weeks, of they had all their legislature sessions on TV. The public perception of Sakharov switched completely from his being viewed as you know, a totally wild, unreasonable person and all to a very admired uh, leader by the whole citizenry. That's what I'm told by Soviet people I know. So um, maybe, maybe we need to have a few more scientists in Congress. You have now only two with PhDs, uh, Russ Holt and Vern Ehlers. Um, and uh, I've always joked with my uh, colleagues to say we need to get Congress to understand that uh, if they cut the funding of science research too much, they're going to be scientists starting to run for office. <laughs> <laughs> but, but seriously, Edwin Land, long ago, the, who founded of Polaroid, uh, he pointed to just this question you brought out and urged that more scientists should go into public life and politics for that reason. But it's something w well worth thinking about. If, uh, anything you do to foster. I, I was actually uh, in December at a meeting that was a surreptitious meeting, bringing Arab scientists together with Israeli scientists with some Americans as sort of the cover. Uh, maybe some of you have heard of the similar meetings that were not so surreptitious between Soviet and American scientists all during the Cold War. And it was wonderful to see how these scientists, Arabs and Israelis, recognized all the common problems they had that they needed to work on. That, of course, you know, hard to do now for the obvious political reasons. But when they go home, they do all they can to work in positive.